Hello there. Today we're going to be taking a look at how to set up and play Pangea, the new game coming to Kickstarter. You can check a link to that in the description below. I am going to be using prototype components though, so the setup and components and rules are subject to change. So with that said, let's go ahead and dive in into how to set up and play Pangea. First you want to assign each player a species and give them each their animal board. Next, you're going to get all the components that go along for each player board. So if you're the invertebrates, you're gonna get all of your uh, evolution cards. You're gonna get all of your animal markers, including your special animal marker. Let's set those to the side. You're also going to want to make sure you have your four objective markers. Set those over there for now. You will wanna make sure you have your initiative marker as well as your dominance marker and you're going to want to have your different action markers. We're gonna set those over there for right now. You should, everybody will have five of those. And last, you're going to have this action marker here, which is going to mark your available action points, and you'll be using those on your board. Next, you want to take the Doom marker and place this at the top of the board on the Epoch track on the very first stage. Next, you want to gather all of the instincts tiles. It's going to be three cataclysm tiles. You're also going to have five zone tiles and four sector tiles. Now, these are going to talk about the board, so let's take a closer look at the board and see what they mean. Now, your game board is divided into a grid, and your vertical columns here are divided into the different sectors A, B, C, and D. A, B, C, and D. Your horizontal groupings are a little bit more complicated because instead of just one, two, three, four, and five, they're actually grouped into continents. The top two uh, rows are Laurasia, the middle is interior, and the bottom is Gondwana. In addition to those being continents, they're also divided into these different regions. So you've got uh, this symbol right here is subpolar, and then you've got temperate with the ferns, then you've got interior right up here. But additionally, you also have a temperate and a subpolar at the top. And so basically, uh, if there were row one, that would be Laurasia subpolar, or the second one would be Laurasia temperate. Uh, the middle one would always be interior. The second to the bottom would be Gondwana uh, temperate. And then finally, at the bottom, we would have Gondwana subpolar. Uh, and that's going to matter because when we look at our different zone tiles, they're going to reference, you know, interior or temperate Gondwana, and they're gonna. That's gonna how how we're gonna establish a grid coordinate system for these by combining sectors and zones. So we're gonna shuffle these up, randomize them. We're gonna choose one cataclysm, one sector, and one zone at random, and this is going to represent the doom, the cataclysm that's going to happen at the end of the world. We're gonna set this up at the doom spot. So this is gonna go right up here to represent the end of the world. Now for all the other spots along this instinct track, we're going to put everything else. So we'll start with our three remaining sectors, and then the four remaining zones, and then the other two cataclysms. Now you're going to get everybody's initiative tokens for all four players, and they're going to go here in the initiative track, uh, first player, second player, third player, fourth player, and you're going to sort those by expansiveness value. So uh, the four for the synapses will be first player, uh, the invertebrates being one will be last player, and everybody else will be sorted according to their value, with the number one side up, and uh, we'll put our green there, our blue there, purple there. And these are all going to be Roman numeral one sided up. Uh, if their uh, hourglass side is showing, that will be an indication that you passed during your turn. Uh, additionally, you'll want to get all of the PD tokens. These are your dominance tokens, and they're going to go right here uh, on the dominance track. And this is the victory point track. Now, it does say PD instead of DP, but these are dominance points. Um, or you can just look at them as victory points. And this is how you win the game by having victory points, the most victory points at the end of the game. As you traverse this, you'll move your person up, and if you go past 20, you will start over and flip this over to the 20 side. You'll also want to find every player's instinct marker, and you'll want to put those down here in the bottom left. 
And this is the instinct track, and it's just going to mark each player's position along the instinct track as they try to figure out which of these zones are safe from the cataclysm. You want to gather and shuffle all the adaptation cards together and put those in a pile and set those right there. Additionally, you want to get everybody's objective markers. Everybody's going to have four of those. So we'll put all of those right here to mark for objectives. And then we'll also want to sort and shuffle our objective tokens, making sure that we keep them in uh, three different piles. We're going to have the Guadalupian, the Cicerulean, and the Lopingian all in their respective piles. And they're going to be going right here. So the first thing we'll do is we'll start off with the Cicerul, and we'll shuffle those out, and we'll put... Uh, four of those down randomly to be revealed at the beginning of the game. And those are going to be objectives and different ways that we can score points. You're also going to have two decks of Turn of the Ages cards, one that's Cicerlian to Guadalupian and one that's Guadalupian to Lopingian. And you want to shuffle those and draw one each, setting those above their respective area for the Turn of the Age figure to Guadalupian and Turn of the Age here to Lopingian. And when we do our Turn of the Ages, will be the time that we'll reveal those and uh, you know, suffer their consequences. You'll also want to flip these over now and take a look at the different objectives that we're going to be starting the game with. These are going to apply only to the first epoch. And uh, once we have a turn of the ages, one of the things we'll do is we'll get rid of these and we'll shuffle in some new ones, but there will be less. Uh, so what these are basically going to be doing is when you have met requirements for one of these objectives, you'll be able to take your colored objective token and place it down here and mark that you've completed this one. So in, in the case of this one, this one wants you to have exactly one animal in each ecological niche, zero, one, and two. We'll talk about what those are because I'm going to look at the board a little bit closer and explain the different zones and how they work. Uh, but if you're the first player to, to accomplish this, you're going to get three victory points. If you're the second player, you'll get two, and anybody beyond the second player only gets one. So there's definitely a race to try to be the first person to accomplish this because this is one of the few ways you can actually earn victory points in this game, and that is how you win. Uh, and you'll, these will stay there, and these will be for all four rounds of the first epoch. Uh, second epoch will only have three rounds, so you know as new objectives come out, they'll be harder and harder to meet. As we look at the board a little bit closer, I want to point out the fact that there are zeros, ones, and twos everywhere. Any number of creatures can be in uh, the niche zero. These are ecological niches and they represent the, the part of an area that any creature can just kind of waltz in and try to graze and have some food. Uh, as we move, and one of the things you'll do is move, when we get up into ecological niche one or niche two, well these niches are smaller and these are representing nicer areas on, in the area, like maybe a cave or a small, you know, a safe area with a natural spring or something like that. And, and they can only hold one animal each and these tokens are representing our animals. So as we get animals and more and more animals on the board and start moving them around, it's important to know that everything generally starts in tier zero uh, in niche zero, but can move up into the higher niches, but only one can be there. So if uh, you will have a contest, if that were to happen, and then maybe force somebody out. Uh, it's also important to notice that each square on this board has a food value, and, and these are sorted into three different numbers, a two, three, and four in this case. So the, the temperate zones are all two, three, and four. Uh, and that means they have a lot of food. They can, you can sustain two animals here in the first epoch, uh, without any kind of uh, repercussions, or three animals in the second epoch, or maybe even four animals in your fourth epoch. And, and that's uh, how many it can feed. If at any point there are more, num uh, more animals than the food will allow, depending on the current epoch, you're going to have to mark that zone with a warning marker, and all of a sudden there's danger that you're gonna have hunger at the end of the turn. So we'll talk about end of turn here in a little bit, but uh, the numbers are gonna be different in different zones. So if you'll notice, these subpolar regions here, they have a value of zero, then one, then two. So for the first epoch, you can't feed any of your animals if they're down here freezing. Same goes with the North Pole as well. There's a lot of symmetry between the boards as they converge into the middle. Uh, the middle has a little bit of food. It's got one, two, and three. So we can only have one animal in each region uh, without worrying about starvation. So hunger is definitely an important part of this game. And this is where we're able to see how much food here is on the board. 
You're also going to notice that between all of these different squares on the board, you're going to see white arrows and red arrows. And that has to do with movement. Uh, moving between white arrows is generally much easier. Uh, moving between red arrows usually incurs a penalty. So we'll talk about that when we talk about the actions that you can take, which are migrating. But the next thing we're going to do after setup is start deploying our first animal. And you're going to do this in player turn order. So the first player in this case would be the synapsids, and they are going to deploy one animal anywhere on the board they would like. You can deploy one down here in the pol some polar regions if you want, uh, but let's say they would put themselves right smack in the middle of the board right there. Next player in turn order will deploy, and they will deploy maybe right here, and so, for so on and so forth. We will continue to deploy. Everybody will deploy one and only one animal, and there we go. Everybody is deployed and we're ready to start the game. So at the start of the first round and actually the start at every round, you're going to get two adaptation cards and you're going to set those down here. You're going to keep them gray side up. You don't want your uh, opponents to see what the special text is, uh, but you're going to want to keep them right here. And they're really great cards that you can use for a variety of different things. Uh, and you're going to keep those next to your evolution cards. Everybody's going to have five unique evolution cards. We'll talk about those a little bit more when we get to actions. You're also going to take a look at what epoch you're on in the first four turns of the game. It's going to be the Cicerulean epoch and then you will mark your action point marker on the appropriate number so in the first epoch you're going to have six action points when we get to the second epoch you'll have seven when we get to the third and final epoch you'll have eight and this is the same for everyone you also want to make sure you have your five cubes handy because when we start taking actions you're going to be marking off which action you've taken with one of these cubes notice that on your board each action can only be taken twice once you've done that, you cannot take that action again. Uh, additionally, you have only five cubes, so at maximum, you can take five actions. If you were to somehow gain action points back and you could afford to take more than five, well, tough cookies, you can't do it. All right, as we look at our player board here, we're going to notice a couple of things. First off, we're going to have our species and our symbol and some artwork over here. We're going to have a special ability. So in the case of the invertebrates, they have a special ability that says once per stage, which is basically per turn, you can remove up to two of your animal markers, but not special animals, from the game board to receive one action point for each removed marker. So they can pull back some of their, their animals and uh, maybe redeploy them uh, elsewhere. And, uh, and that's kind of one of the themes for this particular species. Every, every species has their own special ability, so make sure you note, take note of what your species' special ability is there. You'll also have some flavor text around here. But the thing I want to talk about next is the actions, because we're going to take a look at these actions right here. So this part of the board is going to have the different action point costs for all of the different species, but you're really not going to be concerned with what the other species costs are. Uh, you're really going to be concerned with only this column right here, which is your own action point. Now the four different actions are adapt, populate, migrate, and survive. In short, adapt lets you play evolution and adaptation cards. Uh, one of them, not both. Uh, populate, which they have <laughs> it currently says polate, but uh, the final version will say populate. Uh, and and that is basically allowing you to take your animal markers and put one out on the board in ecological niche zero in a zone of your choice. Uh, migrate allows you to move one of your animals on the board. And survive allows you to move your instinct marker along the instinct track on the board. And I'm going to talk about each of these a little bit more specifically. So the first thing I want to do is talk about adapt. If I were going to adapt, I'd put a cube here, I'd pay two action points. Now I only have six action points for the first turn, so adapt isn't particularly cheap. The only one I have that's cheap is populate. So adapt is something I will want to do, but maybe I can't do too much. Now, one of the things I can do is I can play an adaptation card. Adaptation cards have three different thing, different ways that I can use them. Uh, but basically, when I want to play an adaptation card, I will take one. I can look at it if I want. And then I will set it to the right of my board. Now, I have a hard limit of three adaptation cards that I can have in my hand and three adaptation cards that I can have in play. If at the beginning of any turn I'm dealt more than three adaptation cards, I have to discard down to three. So make sure you remember that you have a hard limit of only three cards in hand. 
Same thing, hard limit of only three adaptation cards in play over here. Now, when an adaptation card becomes active, well, that means it's placed over here. When it's active, I have three different things that I can potentially do with it. First off, I can use this to pay the cost of the evolution cards, which are really good, or I can discard it to get an additional AP, an action point, which is nice, so I can kind of get a point back, which maybe it's not worth it for these guys because it costs them two ad adaptation points just to get it out there. But these stay out there, so I could maybe use it on a following turn, or some, or if I just really needed the point, I could just you know get rid of the card for that. Um, or the really cool thing is I can use the adaptation card ability on the other side of this card. So these are kind of like fast effects or surprise or interrupts where you can be like, oh, you're gonna attack me? Aha, well, I'm super strong now. So in this case, um, you know, and they're all going to tell you when you use them. So this would be something that changes the, the migrate action. Uh, so maybe I, this is going, when I when I migrate from a niche one to two, I can score a victory point, and that's uh, huh, surprise surprise. I played that card, um, you know. And, but but until you flip it over, it's just going to stay here and active and, and be active. Now when you do flip a card over, it's going to be do, use its effect. Then it's going to go back to the discard pile. So they're these are like one shot cards that can do something really cool for you. They can pay the cost for your other cards, or they can get you uh, a, an action point back. And so that is very important. But again, with adapt or with any action, you can only do that twice at most during your turn. So if I wanted to do a second one, boom, boom, I could put my other one down. Or, you know, when I do an adapt action, instead of playing an adaptation card, I could play an evolution card. You know, evolution cards are different because they are going to stay in effect the whole game. So they're permanent bonuses. So some of them are very, very strong. Some of them are a little bit weaker, but they each have a cost as well. And some of them cost zero. So we're going to notice here that the, the star value in here is zero. So that means this card can be played and will go into effect. And just like on this side, I have a hard limit of only three evolution cards that can be active. These do not go away either. So once they're out, I've, I've evolved and that's the way I'm gonna be the whole game. So this gives a lot of replayability to the invertebrates or any species. So even if you play the same species two or three times in a row, you can build them differently each time you play them. And that's important to know. Now there are some that have a cost. So if I wanted to play this particular card, I would have to pay one. Now what one means is I have to discard one active adaptation card. So to play this card, which is going to be a little more powerful, uh, in this case this is going to, when I perform the migrate action, I can spend an extra action point to have two animals migrate. If at least one of them gets to occupy the ecological niche two in this way, I will score a victory point. So this one is increasing my migration ability, which for the invertebrates is actually a really good thing because look, it cost me three to migrate right there. So that's, if I'm able to migrate two creatures for one, I'm saving a lot of you know economy there. So this is a great card. And in order to play that, I would have to, in addition to you know the action, I'd also have to get rid of this card. More powerful cards will cost more. Some species will have uh, evolution cards that actually cost two adaptation cards. So I would have to have at least two adaptation cards out here and I'd be spending those. And that's a, that's a steep cost because you are spending two action points and one of your actions to put that out there. And then, you know, two more action points and one of your actions to put that out there. And then you're having to take another, on a follow-up turn perhaps, uh, another action to, to play the evolution and get those, uh, you know, and discard those without even being able to use them for their other effects. The other thing I want to talk about with adapt, uh, adaptation is your special animals. Every everybody has a single special animal to, uh, token, and you know you may upgrade these in the final game to some of the uh, fancier, uh, you know, three D models and stuff. And these are really really cool. Uh, but the point remains is everybody has a single special animal that's going to look a little different, usually red as compared to their normal color. And what that is going to be represented is one of these evolutions here. Um, now you can only have one special animal uh, and every species is going to have two different versions. So you can go with the cheaper special animal or the more expensive special animal. And they're all and they're going to have different uh, abilities and they're going to reference 
this particular animal. So you might have a special animal that's, uh, that can never be defeated or is extra strong or doesn't need to eat food or you know, does something bad to other, uh, to other animals in the, in the zone and stuff. So you know, you're, you eat every, every special animal card is gonna be a little bit different, but you can only evolve one special animal. So once I've played, for example, if I've played this, this special animal card, uh, I can no longer play this special animal card, so I might as well just put it down there and forget about it. And, uh, and that's the adapt action. So it's something that's really, really nice. It makes your species better and also gives you optional, you know, fast effect type cards or extra AP points for follow up turns or to pay the cost of your evolutions. Very cool aspects to the game. And some of these are really, really fun too. Like there might be a card that you have and somebody's attacking you and you say, ah, well, this is the flea card and you flip it over and reveal it and then you get to move away and you score a victory point for doing that as well. Uh, adaptation cards are another way and, and evolution cards are another way that you can score victory points because a lot of these will allow you to score victory points. And that's important because again, that is how you win the game. And that is the adapt action. Populate is very, very simple. When you use the populate action, you're going to take one of your game pieces, one of your animals, and you're gonna put them anywhere on the board in Ecological Niche Zero. And uh, I've already told you before, but Ecological Niche Zero is a safe haven. You can put any number of creatures in Ecological Niche Zero, so you don't have to worry about if it's already occupied by somebody else. You can put them there and they're fine. They're not gonna fight. You don't have to worry about it. It is worth noting that if you have already researched your special animal, and it is somehow removed from the board, you can always put this special animal back into play with a populate action. When you migrate, you're effectively just moving on the board, but there are some special rules to migrate, so let's look at those. So playing the migrate action allows me to move, and there's different rules depending on where I'm moving. So first I wanna talk about moving within the same zone. Uh, if I am at ecological niche zero, I can move up to one. If I'm at ecological niche one, I can move back down to zero, but I probably wouldn't want to do that. I probably want to move up to two. Two is always the safest area to be and the most likely to survive most of the cataclysmic effects. So two is usually a fairly safe place to be. Uh, however, that's just movement within one square. If I want to move to a left or right square, again, these are in the direction of white arrows, well, I can move to the same number or one lower, but I cannot move one higher. So in the case of moving left or right, if I was at one already and wanted to move left or right, I could move from one to one, or I could move from one to zero. But what I could not do is I could not move from one to two across a left or right white arrow. Now, an interesting thing happens when I want to move from uh, up to down here, across the red arrows. Uh, when you're moving across red arrows, you must go down one. So if I am in ecological niche zero, I actually cannot move across the red arrows unless there's some other game effect that's going to let me do that. For example, the Synapsid's special racial ability does let them ignore that particular mechanic. So there are ways around almost every rule in the game, but the general rule is in order to cross the red lines, you have to go down one. So the only way I could get out of this zone and move up, it would be to go up to the one and then move down with a separate, you know, it, 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 there would be two separate migrate actions, but that's how you could move down. Now, if I was in ecological niche two, I can move down to ecological niche one up here, which would bring us to an interesting thing is because remember, I told you, you can only have one creature in ecological niches one or two. So what happens when somebody attempts to move in to an ecological niche one or two, when there's already someone there, you're gonna have a contest. So what you will do is you will compare your expansiveness. Now this is an opportunity for somebody to maybe flip over one of those adaptation cards that might change the fight. But in this case, I would have uh, one uh, for my expansiveness. And this is the synapses. They have an expansiveness of four, so they would win the fight. Now, when a fight occurs, the loser simply gets bumped down to zero. Now. Normally, fights don't ever occur in ecological niche zero, so if somebody else moves in here to ecological niche zero, it's big enough that we don't have to fight, there's no contest, everybody coexists peacefully in ecological niche zero. 
if a game effect does cause a contest to occur in ecological niche zero, the loser is removed from the board and returned to their user's pile of animal tokens. So that's basically almost the same as being killed. There are game effects that will allow you to devour an opponent after a contest, which will remove them automatically. But by and large, when somebody is up here and someone else moves in, they'll fight, the lower person gets kicked down, and so on and so forth. If uh, this guy was up here and then he wanted to move up there, it would bump him down to the next lower one, provided there is space available. If not, they would just keep going down. And that's basically how migrating works. It's moving, and then if you're in the same place as somebody else and you must fight, which is generally only in ecological niches one or two, then you will have a contest, and it's all part of the migrate action. And for in the case of the invertebrates, it's very expensive. It costs them three points to do it, so they might not want to migrate very much. They might use their special ability to recall some guys and then redeploy them elsewhere, but you are capped on actions, so you may not be able to do that as much as you want to do. So this whole migration thing is offering a lot of planning, and you need to really think about where you want to move, because you can only move twice in any given turn. And the last action I want to talk about is survive. Hey, you will, if you were going to pay two points and put a action marker down there on the survive action, you are going to then be able to access the instinct track, and that is important. So let's take a closer look at the instinct track and how that works. So if I move up on the instinct track, I'm going to find my, my instinct marker for my particular player, and I'll move it up one. And when I move it up one, I'm able to look at this particular card. So in this case, I will look at this sector card and I can see, ooh, sector C. So this is almost like the game of Clue in a way because this tells me that sector C is now not the location where our cataclysm is going to hit. And as I move up, I will be learning more and more about. So if I were to do the instinct action again, I would be able to move up. Oh, now C and B are both safe. And so the more I move up, the more I'm going to learn. Now, I will point out that when you get to the third spot, you're going to gain three victory points in addition to gaining more information. Now I know that B, C, and D are all clear, which tells me the cataclysm is going to hit on section A, which if I look at the board, that means that far area is not necessarily the safest area to be. So that much is very cool. As we move up farther and farther throughout the game, and sometimes you'll find special uh, abilities that let you move up a little bit farther. Uh, we'll, we'll see different things. So, for example, we might get this particular one that says subpolar Laurasia. Laurasia is the top continent, and subpolar is the top zone there. So that means the very top row is safe. Uh, this one would tell us interior zone. Oh, so then the very middle is safe. And we'll slowly be able to figure out which ones, which temperate Laurasia is safe. So it seems like it's going to hit A somewhere in the bottom and then temperate zone Guan Gondwana. So now we've learned that the cataclysm is going to hit in the bottom left hand zone of the game right over there. So that's pretty useful information. But there's more to it because there's also the different cataclysms. And we're going to talk about that. Um, I do want to point out one thing. As you're approaching the cataclysm track, you're going to notice there's another spot up here. This one gives you four victory points. So this is yet another way you are going to earn victory points. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the instinct track is a nice way to get a nice little boost when you get this far. Uh, when you want to start peeking at the Cataclysm card, you're going to notice that the Instinct Track breaks down into double moves. So when you go from here to here, you're not actually going to get to peek at anything. You have to do uh, survive one more time, and then you gain a victory point here, and then you gain to the ability to look at that. Oh, so I know it's not going to be the massive planetoid. And if I were to somehow Instinct two more times, I would get yet another victory point, and I would realize, oh, it's not going to be the super volcano. And then we're going to realize, you know, by process of elimination, what these last three might be. And that's going to be important because we're going to talk about the doom and what that will do. So whatever the doom is, it's going to kill everything in its respective square as well as everything above, below, and to the left and right of it. 
everything that is diagonal from it is also going to die with the exception of those that are in ecological niche two. So that's, you know, so it's not just hitting one single square, it's also impacting everything immediately around it. However, there are three different types of things that we can experience in the base game. We've got the eruption of the supervolcano, the massive planets right in the gamma rays, and they all have extra different things they can do. So the supervolcano is going to cause global cooling, and it's going to mean that all animals in the interior zone, which is the very center, and in... Uh, and in ecological niche, two of the temperate zones survive, which basically means it's going to kill everything in the polar regions and most of the stuff in the temperate zones. So being in ecological niche, two is, you know, generally, generally safe, but even if you were far away and you were in one of those polar zones, you would still die. However, the massive planetoid is going to have the exact opposite effect. That's going to cause extreme heat, and that's going to make sure that all animals in the subpolar zones survive and also in the ecological niche two of the temperate zones. So, so far, it seems like the temperate zones, uh, if you can get into ecological niche two of those, that's a safe place to be. But then we've got gamma rays. Gamma rays are a little different because they <laughs> annihilate their entire subcontinent. Remember, we talked about the top two uh, rows were the Laurasia subcontinent, the bottom two were Gondwana, and the interior counts as its own subcontinent. Yeah, the gamma rays will completely kill everything on the entire subcontinent that it's on. And on top of that, it will kill everything across the entire board that is in niche zero. So if you're in ecological niche one, you might survive the gamma rays, but you definitely want to try and be in ecological niche two if you can. So the doom is going to wipe out an awful lot of, of creatures. And, and that's an important thing to, to think about because you're also going to score victory points for every creature that is left, or every animal that is left on the board at the end of the game. Uh, I'm going to point out that there is no distinction between a special creature, the red-rimmed version, and regular creature as it is applying to victory points. Every creature counts as exactly one victory point at the end of the game, and you must must have at least one creature left on the board. So if all of your creatures were in various zeros across the board and gamma rays hits and annihilates all of your creatures, you score zero points, regardless of how far ahead on the track you were. So back to the turn order, those were the four actions that you can take. You're going to be taking different actions and consuming action points. Maybe you've run out of action points. Maybe you migrated two times and that cost you all six. Or maybe you did three actions that were two points each or any other combination and you've run out of action points. Well, then you can pass. You will flip your marker over to the hourglass side on the board and then you are done for the rest of the game. However, you still can respond if somebody attacks you and you have an adaptation card that's going to let you, you know, maybe poison them or, or escape or something like that but you're done taking actions. Once everyone has passed, we're going to go to the end of the round. So one of the things we're going to do at the end of the round is we're going to check hunger. Now when we check hunger, we're going to look for any of these little warning markers that we might have placed as multiple creatures were moving in. And we're going to notice that this area right here has three creatures but only supports two, uh, two creatures. Uh, so we're going to put a hunger marker in that system. And that basically means that the creatures here have exhausted the food supply in that region. This hunger marker is going to remain for all four of the turns uh, in the first epoch. Basically, hunger markers will remain all the way until the end of the epoch, and uh, it takes that long for, basically, for the, for the grass to regrow and for the wildlife to repopulate, etc. So it's telling you a lesson. Don't exhaust your food supply uh, because there's repercussions that are going to last a long time. And once that happens, every creature that's here, that, that, that is still in a zone with a, food, with a hunger marker in it, now has to be removed. So they all die of starvation. Now, there is an exception to that. If you have victory points, you can spend a victory point to save a creature. You can keep him there if you want, if you're the blue player, or if you're the green player, you can spend, or everybody can spend a victory point and keep their, 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 their animals there. Uh, but that's gonna cost you, and it's gonna cost you every round if you wanna keep them there. So you may wanna move them out. 
Uh, now, in this zone, we didn't have a warning marker here because maybe we forgot or whatever. The warning markers are really just there to help you out, so we'd also have to put one here. And that is something really to think about because the more hunger markers that are out there, the more you're limiting where people can deploy and where people can move without running the risk of having to lose victory points or lose their creatures because you only have so many actions and, and starving people out can really be a problem, especially when your populate action might cost you multiple action points. So, you know, if you're causing somebody like maybe the synapsids here, there we go, the synapsids, you see they cost three to populate. So it really hurts them if you starve them out because they're having to use half of their whole turn just to put one dude back out there. So if you can starve your opponent out, that's definitely one strategy. Uh, we're also going to move the Doom Marker to the next round, and we will then uh, reassign these uh, initiative markers based on victory points. So if uh, at the end of this round, victory points were maybe like that, whoever is in last place is now going to go first, and then... And, and so on and so forth, and then whoever is in first place is going to go last. So, you, so these will change at the end of each round. So they can that can affect tiebreakers. That can affect who will go first. So now this player who went first last turn is not going to go first on the following turn. And then, of course, you're going to give everybody two more adaptation cards. And if they are over three cards, they will have to discard down to three. So as we go from turn to turn, we're going to get closer and closer to the end of the first epoch. And as we finish the fourth turn, we're going to move this little doom marker into our first turn of the ages, which is going to begin the turn of the ages step. So one of the things we're going to do when we start this turn of the ages is we're going to reveal our first turn of the ages card and apply its effect. In this case, it's going to allow each player to uh, migrate in initiative order, and they're going to be able to go up. Uh, by one. Now this is going to help some people, it may hurt some people, or may not hurt you, but may not give you a whole lot. Maybe migrating for you costs three, and this is a free migrate, so this could be very, very effective for somebody like maybe the invertebrates, uh, or somebody who uh, had a, you know, was trying to escape a predator, so they get to go up one more and get a little bit out of reach. So. So that's, you know, sometimes they're, sometimes they're helpful. Sometimes they'll let you deploy for free and put some more animals out on the board and all kinds of cool stuff like that. So that's the first thing that we're going to do. We're also going to do two more things. Next up, we're going to get rid of all of the hunger markers across the board. And that is very good because now it means, hey, years and years and years have passed. Now this farmland is regrowing and it's vibrant enough. And uh, you're going to also start looking at the middle number for the next epoch. So that means there's even more food. So it's grown back and it's better than ever. And of course, every zone is gonna be using the middle one, not just the ones that were starving, but it's important to know that for all of these type of things, you're gonna be using the middle number now because you are now in the second epoch. And then lastly, we're gonna get rid of all of these objectives. And if you didn't score it by then, tough luck, you're out of luck. Uh, now we're gonna deal out the Guadalupian uh, objectives, but if you notice, there's only four, and we're only going to deal three of them out, and now all of a sudden there's only three, so there's less objectives and less turns to try to get them, and these are going to be a little bit harder objectives, but they still follow the same general rules. If you're the first player to do it, you'll gain more, second player you'll gain only two, and everybody else only gains one, and uh, this one's like three animals in a region, or remove somebody else's animal from the board, or, you know, they're just kind of following the same thing, but they're usually things you needed a couple of terms to ramp up in order to do. I will also point out that the last set, uh, the Lopingian objectives, when those come out during the second turn of the ages, where you're going to do all of this again, those are special and they are only going to score for the first player only. So whoever ever does them first scores, but nobody else can score. So that is basically the way turn of the ages will work. After you've completed Turn of the Ages, you'll move right there, and then you'll start another normal turn. So it's important to know that during these Turn of the Ages steps, you're not having people take actions. You're only performing those steps and then performing the next regular turn. So then we're going to take three more turns, then we're going to do our second Turn of the Ages. We're going to reveal an, our other Turn of the Ages card uh, in, in initiative order. They can populate any a ne ecological niche one or two. So this is allowing you to take somebody from your reserves, put them on the board, 
straight into a one or a two. So that's really, really strong. That's awesome. Um, I'm getting to do that. You're also gonna clear hunger again, and then you're gonna deal out those new Lopingian objectives. And, uh, and then you'll move to here to so the final two turns. You'll start the last two turns. Um, and this is where the pressure is really on to hopefully people have been going up the instinct track. Hopefully if you haven't been going up the instinct track, you've been following the players who have, and you've got only a few turns left and not many action points. Granted, it's important to know out as we get into these higher uh, levels, you will start by having either seven or even eight action points, depending on which epoch we are in. So you can do a little bit more on those last two turns because you're gonna start with eight points as opposed to six or seven, but uh, you have less turns to actually make them work. At the end of this final turn here, we then stop and it's time to reveal the doom. And we'll flip these over and go into the doom. Now I talked about the doom already, what the gamma rays do, what, uh, you know, where it hits the um, impact. In this case, uh, you know, we would reference our little card here and see, all right, which, which cataclysm is this again? And then you'd have to figure out who dies and who stays on the board. We'd then clear stuff off. All right, all of those guys are dead. Everything in zero is dead. And then we would look and see who was left on the board. Now, if nobody survives, well, then nobody's worthy to win. Then you kick everybody out and you play again another time. And then hopefully somebody manages to win. But yes, you do need to have at least one creature uh, on the board to even be eligible to score any points at all. So you will have a fat score of zero if you have no creatures survive. I have seen it happen and it is a little embarrassing, but it can actually quite easily happen if you're not careful. So uh, then you will add one point for every creature that survives and whoever has the most victory points is the winner. And that is Pangea. All right, guys, so that was Pangea. Now, there are some additional rules if you are playing with less than four players. There are these AI boards and dice that you'll roll, and there will be uh, neutral animals on the board. Uh, I'm not covering all of that in this video. Uh, however, there is a little bit more to the game out there if you are now interested. I will put a link in the description below to the Kickstarter where you can check out Pangea, uh, but definitely let me know what you think in the comments below. If you like this video, uh, feel free to subscribe. Go ahead and give the video a thumbs up. It definitely helps out the channel. It definitely helps me out, and I definitely appreciate uh, my, your continued support. I want to thank you all so much for watching, and as always, have a great day.